Hey folks, Jackto here. Dragon's Dogma 2 is literally a couple of days away and here I am to offer you a final full preview of everything we know about DD2 so far to fully prepare you for this mighty game's launch. With no stone unturned, let's dive into a quick preface. Do I need to actually play Dragon's Dogma 1 before embarking on DD2? And according to director Hideako Itsuno, playing the first game is not necessary because DD2 is is going to follow a classic amnesia trope. As the player becomes the Arisen, whose heart is seized by a dragon, they embark on a quest to then defeat this formidable beast. And the dragon symbolises the world's destruction, soaring through the skies and breathing scorching flames. Some fear the dragon's descent, while others revere it as a godlike entity. Basically, all you need to know. Now, although knowing the first game's mechanics can enhance the experience and understanding the sort of time loop narrative of the original may help you, it is not a must, making it very easy for anyone to pick up the rich narrative and somewhat complex terminology of DD2. Either way, if you haven't played the original game or you've forgotten, I've got a quick small story set up to prepare you. So in Dragon's Dogma 2, the story diverges from the original as it's actually set in a parallel universe and we gather that it potentially could be post the great hereafter, which is the default ending of DD1. One, where the Arisen cycle is shattered and basically the world now faces imminent decline. With DD2, the emergence of a new Arisen introduces a fresh new narrative with a new perspective. And the narrative now unfolds against the backdrop of the human kingdom Vermund and the Beastron kingdom Batal, forgetting the stretches of Grand Sorin from the original. And in this power struggle, we have Queen Regent Disa who has manipulated the throne with a false Arisen backed by mysterious pawns, revealing connections to potentially alternative universes and other Arisen cycles, as we're not 100% sure on this false Arisen's claim, also raising questions about their legitimacy is the fact that they can command pawns. And of course the sequel does promise a multiverse spanning saga with potentially endless time loops and plot twists, potentially encounters similar to godlike entities in the original like the Seneschal or even shadow versions of the original game game's characters now in DD2, with characters like Ulrika in DD2 potentially fulfilling characters like Kina's role in the original. Ultimately, DD2 sets itself apart from the original, this time more so enacting as a fulfilled vision of the director. And so jumping into the mechanics of DD2, the game boasts a robust character creation system akin to the original, but now offering even more extensive customization options that you can actually go check out for yourself. The photogrammetry technology ensures was that realistic character visuals with two body types per race, nine base bodies and over 100 real life human head scans. This creator caters to both detailed customization and simple image based creation, making it accessible to a broad player base. And the game features two playable races, humans centrally positioned in Vermont's political upheaval and the new Beastron race, with a unique narrative and cat like features like the Khajiit in the Elder Scrolls. And we do have elves which are only available as pawns due to story constraints. However, if you are looking to play as an elf, you can basically give your Arisen elf ears, pulling off a half elf look if you so desire. And the customization itself does draw inspiration from Dark Souls and Fallout and of course the original, with specific features being able to be fine tuned through sliders, covering your physique, body hair, makeup and so on. The complexity of this system surpasses the original in massive ways and that is a huge compliment because the original was already fantastic with its unique personalization. In DD2 we can customize our butt, teeth, hair tip colors, sheen and so much more. It is a meticulously detailed system ensuring satisfaction across the board for whatever your diverse preferences are for your Arisen and your main pawn. I've already created my Taylor Swift as my main pawn as you can see. Could you have expected any less of me. And speaking more on pawns, for those who don't know, they're basically these unique AI companions from the Rift that bring charm and humour and a somewhat multiplayer element to the game. While Dragon's Dogma is absolutely a single player RPG, these companions serve you, offering a lot of guidance, plot threads and help across your journey. As the Arisen, you are able to craft one main pawn and then recruit two more through the pawn network, which means that you yourself could actually recruit my 
Taylor Swift pawn as one of your own allies, should you wish to. And it means that you can also recruit your friends' pawns, ensuring diverse experiences across the board. Now, pawns exhibit individuality, evolving personalities and knowledge through quests, leading to thrilling encounters. Ultimately, you're going to be recruiting pawns to enrich your adventure with varied skills and quest knowledge. So with vocations, inclinations and specialisations, players can really tailor their main pawn to their unique preferences and gameplay style. For example, I'm going for a thief main arisen and I'm going to have an archer main pawn backing me up, with most indefinitely having a warrior and a sorcerer join later down the line to ensure that I have a good varied team. And so let's talk about the world this time around. DD2 promises an intricately detailed and immersive fantasy world where characters, monsters and environments leverage cutting edge physics, character AI and graphics for a truly captivating experience. The tale unfolds in the human kingdom, the Mund, ruled by a false arisen as the king, which is marked by lush green landscapes and a fortified city with a sprawling commoner town. Another area, the sacred arbour, is home to the elves, a race preferring isolation and speaking their own unique language, posing communication challenges unless you have a pawn who can speak elvish. In Batal, the nation of the Beastron, of their own unique cat-like culture, and ancient ruins in steep canyons, citizens there revere the lambent flame instead of the arisen, showcasing distinct beliefs nurtured by their harsh natural environment, led by Empress Nadinia. And of course, filling the world are the unique, fresh cast of characters in this parallel universe, distinct from the original. However, some could certainly act as shadow versions of the original cast in DD1. Now already, the game's website is already showcasing a diverse ensemble this time around, each character contributing to the unfolding narrative in many different ways, like Ulrika, the responsible leader of Melv, who is going to save our Arisen after the dragon attack, Nadinia, the benevolent leader of Batal, Brant, an honest and demoted palace guard captain, Disa, the scheming queen with royal grace, Minelia, a royal beastron guard, Wilhelmina, the enigmatic proprietress of Rose Chateau, Sven, a princely yet sincere candidate for consul ruler, Glinda, a gentle and timid elf interested in human tools, and Durian, Glinda's refined sister with elegant manners. Speaking of those main characters, of course DD2 reintroduces the original's romance system as revealed by game director Itsuno in an exclusive interview with IGN Japan. He mainly focused on Ulrika, a human female closely tied to the main character, emerging now as a potential heroine candidate for the Arisen, with players having full control over the development of their relationship. The producer emphasised that romantic options are entirely driven by player choices, setting a standard for the game's romance system. The main characters, such as but are not limited to, are Ulrika, Brandt, Dorian, Wilhelmina and everybody else on the website's main page, offering captivating storylines. But just like the original, even smaller scale NPCs can be love interests based on player interactions. The NPC system this time around is significantly enhanced, showcasing intricate relationships and autonomous behaviour, with potential conflicts arising over the player character. You could say our Arisen this time is more of a Arisen. To influence relationships, i.e. gaining max affinity with one specific NPC, players can use the Heartfelt Pendant, very much similar to the Arisen's bond from the first game. However, to acquire the Heartfelt Pendant, you are unfortunately going to have to pre-order DD2. Now, the ESRB board has noted sexual content in DD2, including interactions with sex workers and brief cutscenes with characters in underwear, introduced Introducing new elements not seen largely in the previous installment. Apparently there were a few sex scenes in the original game. I did not come across these but my comment section has absolutely assured me that there were smaller cutscenes in the original game. However, it definitely seems like they are more grand scale now with an official ESRB rating confirming the nature of such sexual content. So all in all, romance is back and everybody's heart is for the taking. Now while your Arisen may have their heart on somebody in particular, Capcom have unveiled a crucial feature which is going to make you even more protective over specific NPCs because NPC deaths in DD2 are now permanent, adding an extra layer of consequence to our actions. With over a thousand NPCs, each now possessing unique motivations and stories, players must contend with the reality of NPC mortality. As Itsuno has emphasised the normality of NPC deaths in this fantasy world, urging players to protect cherished 
characters during battles or opt for the desperate measure of holding and literally fleeing with them. And so, once an NPC dies, they move to the morgue in the city, where players can then use a wake stone to revive them within a very limited time frame. However, if that NPC is not revived in time, they will be permanently buried, adding a lasting consequence. So it's not the end of the world if your favourite NPC does die, because you can revive them, but be very quick to do so. Either way, protect the heck out of your love interest or just specific NPCs that you're really growing attached to. Now, speaking on quests, which is one of the ways we can gain high affinity with specific NPCs, in the world of DD2, we have a lot of diverse inhabitants, from travellers to soldiers, carrying out their daily lives, each driven by their own unique goals and emotions. As you explore the world, NPCs may approach you, seeking assistance in quests that are going to add depth to your narrative. And pawns, being your knowledgeable companions across the world, are going to guide you if they are familiar with your current quest. And beyond the main story's narrative, numerous quests are going to emerge from interactions within the world's demisons, giving players the autonomy to decide their journey's course. However, getting from one part of the world to another isn't as straightforward as you would expect. In a recent IGN interview, Itsuno expressed a strong preference for engaging open-world exploration over quick map-based travel, stating that travel is only perceived as boring when your game lacks excitement. And both Dragon's Dogma titles have featured limited fast travel options, requiring players to use valuable resources such as ferry stones for convenience. And Itsuno has emphasised the team's effort in creating a world where unexpected encounters add thrill to your journey, encouraging players to choose between walking or utilising the new ox cart based fast travel system. And this system, similar to Skyrim's wagons, introduces complications with random encounters, such as goblin blockades or griffins targeting the player's wagon. The director acknowledging the convenience of more generous fast travel systems, but asserts that DD2's focus on a grounded and dynamic approach to open world exploration is what sets it apart. And adding alongside that, we now have a dynamic day-night cycle, posing challenges as nightfall brings deep darkness, making navigation difficult without a light source, a key element also in DD1. But now, players can set up campsites at night to alleviate fatigue and also interact with our allies. The real-time passing of time influences encounters, with emergent events and destructible environments adding depth to our gameplay. It sooner reveals that meat for campfire cooking is also authentic, sourced from live-action footage for realism and cost-effectiveness. And of course, as we're venturing through the world and engaging in combat, the choice of your vocation is pivotal and is probably one of the most dynamic and unique points of Dragon's Dogma, shaping your entire gameplay experience with unique abilities, strengths and weaknesses. And this time around, DD2 offers 10 vocations that we know about, characterised into basic, advanced and hybrid classes. Initially, you're going to choose one of the four basic vocations and you're going to gradually unlock more through quests and relevant NPCs. The first starting class that you're going to choose is the Archer, the Thief, the Mage or the Fighter. Of course, Archers excel in long-range precision attacks, supporting allies strategically. The Thief is a swift melee specialist with a focus on damage bursts and item theft. The Fighter dominates frontline combat, serving as a tank and protector with a one-handed sword and shield. And the Mage is your versatile magic support class, wielding offensive, defensive and healing magic. Vocation changes, very much different from the original, are now facilitated by questing and deepening your relationships with vocation masters, who you are going to find throughout the world. The advanced vocations we have so far are the warrior and the sorcerer, enhancing the fighter and the mage's prowess in very much different ways, as the warrior focuses on powerful charged attacks with a two-handed weapon, introducing new skills like barge for crowd control, whereas the sorcerer is a more powerful, slower magic class, offering even more devastating spells with Galvanize and Quick Spell for stamina management. And then we have hybrid vocations, something that Dragon's Dogma has really built a pillar on in the gaming landscape. These classes offer a distinctive blend of rogue, warrior and mage classes, blending a few of them together to create a truly unique experience. And these classes are unique to the Arisen player character, so your pawns cannot be hybrid vocations. And for these we have the Magic Archer, excelling in long-range magic 
magical combat, offering healing and support using a bow. The Mystic Spear Hand is a brand new class, very much similar to the Mystic Knight from the original, now combining melee and magic with a new duo spear weapon for a balanced playstyle with a lot of teleportation spells. The Trickster is a new vocation, manipulating illusions through a weapon called the Sensor, providing more of a strategic and support playstyle, while your pawns act more as damage dealers. And then we have the brand new Warfarer, basically your Jack of All Trades versatile vocation, with the ability to use every weapon and learn skills from various vocations, offering a unique blend of gameplay styles, from going from equipping a warrior's two-handed sword to equipping a huge staff to do a devastating ice spell. If you're struggling on what vocation to go for, definitely go for the Warfarer towards the end game. Across the board, from a variety of opinions, the impressions of DD2 have been really, really positive. So if you're going in expecting a high thrill, very fun, combat-focused action RPG, with then a rustic, fast-travel system, potentially uncapped at 30 FPS, you're going in with the right expectations. So do keep those tempered as we approach DD2, but I hope that this video has offered a decent full preview of Dragon's Dogma 2 as the game literally launches in the coming days. Let me know what you're most excited to experience in this RPG. I'm all for the NPCs, the characters, and the romance system. I'm excited to meet Ulrika and explore this world as a mystic spear hand. Love to know all your thoughts down below, but of course, until the next one, as we follow up Dragon's Dogma 2, you're already in the right place. I've been Jackdaw, and I should go. Whoa, 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 whoa.